Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a joint presentation. The, the original plan was that there would be three of us speaking, but unfortunately, as we heard yesterday, that, that Agnes, oh yeah, it does work, uh, went down with COVID last week. So, um, a bit of a mad scramble on Tuesday. I had a 45 minute Zoom uh, meeting with her, so I'm going to be giving her part of the uh, presentation along with my own, and then Martin Gusson is going to uh, speak at the end of putting everything into context. So please bear with me um, when I do Agnes's bit. I may have to make some of this up. Um, so the next, there we go. So the overview of the, um, of the presentation is we're going to give you a, a little slide about where I'll hear her through the keyhole, and I may explain what, why we're calling it keyhole later, keyhole later uh, where it fits into a, a larger project, which would have been done by um, Agnes. Then I'm going to say a little bit about the, uh, the challenge of using hexagon um, imagery um, in the study. Agnes was then going to talk about how she went about georeferencing the images. And then finally, at the end, Martin will talk about the uh, contextualizing the images and, and what we've learned from it. So the first part, I'll hear it through the keyhole. I don't know whether you know. Why, why keyhole? Well, it's at the bottom, actually. There's a little... Um, Another name for hexagon is KH, and the KH actually stands for keyhole. And that was the, uh, the, the, uh, the code name that was given to the, the camera system that was carried by the satellite. So this is a uh, part of a larger uh, study that's being funded by DFG, uh, looking at late antique, uh, late antique and early Islamic urbanistic transformation. Um, the aim is of this particular part of the project is to see how we can use hexagon satellite imagery to complement other sources. So, oops, we've got um, Corona, GOI, Google Earth, UAV, and some um, magnetometry um, to look how over time the uh, encroachment of modern settlements has occurred into the, uh, the Alhira area and not yet but ultimately to see if we can try and produce a, a DTM using the, uh, the stereo imagery acquired by one of the hexagon missions. Um, I'll move on here. In order to understand what we're doing you've really got to understand what hexagon is. I'm sure everybody is aware of Corona and the huge impact that that has had on uh, archaeological perspective. Um, Hexagon was a, the follow-on system to uh, Corona, operational between the 1970s and 1980s. Um, like Corona, carried a couple of stereo uh, uh, panoramic cameras, um, but the quality was certainly far, is far much better than Corona. So here's, a, here's an example from uh, East Sussex, I think it is, in, in southern England. This is, the, this is a chalk figure uh, on, on the Downlands, uh, the Longman of Wilmington. So in 1973, Hexagon was giving this product compared with Google Earth satellite imagery from uh, a year ago. So it's a good high quality product. Um, the other thing is that, like Corona, there's a huge archive of um, photographs available. They were first declassified back in 2013, but then all that was available was coverage of the United States. However, from the um, late 2022 onwards, it actually become available through the USGS Geog uh, Earth Explorer website. Hexagon, whoa. Hexagon was a was a big beast. It was named a big bird in the in the newspapers. And they managed to find out, but it's it's about the size of the uh, the shuttle bus that we came on from the airport. 
this big beast, big rocket to launch it. Um, film, probably I think each camera had around about 25 kilometers of film to uh, take pictures with, an awful lot of film. And periodically throughout the mission, through these little recovery buckets, film was returned to Earth for processing. So, um, very conveniently, uh, Emily Hammer and Jason Ur, with their, they, they published a paper in Antiquity last year, or maybe 20, yes, 2022, and they do have a, 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 an online uh, site that shows the, uh, the coverage of, uh, of Hexagon. And you can see it is, yep, it's, a, it's an American uh, system, so not surprisingly, it was looking at Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, uh, Southeast Asia, but also the Middle East as well. Uh, and each of these little hexagons that they, they, they put are color coded for the number of um, images that are, that are covered in, in those areas. Um, if we zoom in, zoom back, Alhira is, is this square, you can just about see it here in Iraq. Um, if we zoom in, there's around about a thousand images that are covered by, by that, that, that hexagon. So that's given a bit of a problem of, of deciding which one shall we go for. The other challenge is that this was a panoramic camera. So there's huge panoramic distortions. This is a, uh, just an example. It is, it's, not, it's not hexagon, but it's showing the distortion of a, so this is a uniform grid of squares when they appear actually on a, hexagon on a uh, panoramic camera, so huge distortion towards the edges as it's looking out. Um, this beast is traveling at around about 20, 20 odd thousand kilometers an hour overhead, nine kilometers a second. So there's huge image motion um, that has to be compensated for that results in this huge distortions. Um, not surprisingly, the, uh, the ground, the, the kind of spatial resolution increases the further from below the satellite uh, you get away. Um, so that was, that's one of the problems is the huge, um, huge distortion. The second one is that whereas Corona just did a single swath looking, I think it was 90 degrees, uh, 45 degrees either side of where it was traveling, Hexagon went out to 120 degrees, but also it could actually be steered to look at different parts of the, uh, the area. So this is just a, a, a simulation really. So this is the full swath. So the satellite's coming down, it's looking. So you've probably got about 600 kilometers by about 20, 30 kilometers uh, in each strip. Oh, I hate this. Um, the thumbs, problem is my thumb's too big, chop my thumb off. Um, but it could also look to the left, it could look to the right, it could look to the center, really to conserve film throughout the mission, which lasted a couple of months or so. So it, it, could, it could do that. And the challenge is that the, um, we don't know, we can see what the, um, the footprint on the ground looks like from the Earth Explorer, but we'll never know really from just what we can see whereabouts relative to where the satellite was, the, uh, the actual target area, because the further away we get, the more distortion. So the solution that I adopted was one to model the, um, the orbit of the, the satellite using a the freeware version of a commercial package called STK. Um, and I successfully used this with Corona. So I use freely available two-line elements. It's a, it's a technical term, which is the ephemeris 
of the satellite historical ephemeris, which when you apply Kepler's laws to, you can work out in time and space where the satellite was. Um, and then using a sensor, rectangular sensor, to represent the, um, the footprint. And there we go. So we can, we can uh, take this. That's the, rep that's the yellow is what the Earth Explorer is saying. The footprint is the white is what the model footprint and that is actually more realistic because it is bow tie shaped because contrary to popular belief the earth is not flat it is actually curved um, so we then looked at where on the uh, position relative to the satellite the Alhira site was we could check whether it was cloud free and then make an assessment of, of how uh, the likely uh, distortion and it worked. The, the approach worked. We managed to do out of the 12 um, missions, nine of them were, were, could be modelled. For some reason, I couldn't get the ephemeris for mission 1217. The footprints agreed with what the, um, the USGS were saying. And you can see the difference in uh, the distortion. So this is part of the, 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 the more modern settlement on Najaf which is very close to the, um, the line of flight of the satellite and it's quite a, it's slightly distorted but when you get further away there's far more distortion. So from those we chose five uh, photographs which were funded kindly by ARG um, and this is showing where they are. You can see one of which was, I'll dispense with what the first one, this one here, for some reason the negative, the, the image was overexposed and of course you can't predict that from the modelling, but otherwise there were more or less expecting to have high to possibly slight reduced spatial resolution and distortion. Um, we then came on to, so this is um, Agnes's point, part of the uh, work, georeferencing, we have a problem because from the Ukraine work, um, excuse me, and the, and the ARG Ukraine working group, we knew that we needed to have at least 25, 30 um, control points on, the, on, the, on a, a, a smallish size segment of, of the, the image. Um, we and that would allow us to georeference to around about um, 10, 12 meters or so. The, the problem is that Ukraine was lovely. Lots of fields, lots of roads. We could, I could easily identify control points on there. Here we've got a problem. The area that we're interested in is here and there's hardly any control points that we can use. So Agnes took points to the the west, the, uh, the south, the east, so I think there's a couple up there. Uh, this area is now inundated with water, so we couldn't use that. Um, but she managed to uh, georeference them. I don't think she's, she's actually calculated the, how accurate this is. Let's see what we've got. So this is the pipeline. Sing downloaded image from, uh, or scans of the image from USGS for about nine gigabytes per image, conveniently provided in around about 750 meg um, chunks, from which she extracted the those areas that corresponded to the, the, the survey area. She did a, 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 a histogram equalization just to, to bring out some of some of the detail. Georeferenced using QGIS and that resulted in the georeferenced images and if we just move on to this come on wakey wakey all oh, right it's gonna sleep now oh, it's there all oh, right okay so this is the correct this is corona not much you can see um corona from about 68 or so there's something appearing here so this is around uh hexagon it's coming out more 
another hexagon image from 73. You can see in relief. 74 was a particularly good, good mission um, with quite a lot being seen. Then we've got a, this is a hexagon 82, so quite grainy this one. Um, GOI, yeah. Uh, a Foshan XXX. I googled this and got some very dodgy websites, so I shut away very quickly. We we don't know the actual uh, origin of this uh, this data set. I understand. And here's the magnetometry. The key thing is that what it's showing is that we can we can model the uh, predicted um, performance of the system, but we can't actually model the actual performance because there are other factors that coming into play perhaps sand being blown over, hiding is a semi-arid environment, hiding the features, um, and there's, there's lots of variables that we just don't actually have much control of. Over to Martin now. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Sorry, I'm afraid. Okay. The settlement of Alhira is located near Dajav in present day Iraq, about 160 kilometers south of Baghdad. For the history of early Islamic architecture and urban planning, the legendary Arab royal seat of the 5th and 6th century which was further used until the 10th century is of fundamental importance as a reference point. In contrast to the significance of the site, the location and the extent of the historic Settlement was only a, 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 a approximately known. The area is now severely affected by modern land use. The Hira survey project was initiated 2015 as first international archaeological mission in central, central Iraq since, since the Gulf War. Until 2018, um, surface surfing and large scale large scale hot prospections as UAV over flight and magnetometer hot prospection have been carried out. Oops. So based on the survey results the accurate archaeological potential of the surveyed area was ev was evaluated but especially in the central area north and within the airport dense settlement Cluster were identified. It's there in the middle. To explore these findings in more detail, further had prospections and targeted excavations were, were carried out in the last years. As the area of his 
of his historical hero is undoubtedly over overbuilt by modern settlement documentary aerial imagery were included in the research to be able to reconstruct a layer landscape landscape conditions by Anna Dising had the images of the of the Hulk Corona and hexagon visions had the growth of bottom settlement since the 1960s can be traced. Due to the accident with the visibility of archaeological formations in the hexagon images, but especially in the in the results of the 1974 vision, it is now possible how to trace the edges of the his historical settlement, the, the extent to the west and the south, which have been hitherto unknown, could be identified. Here are courtyard buildings, there, and here are traces of dense small scale settlement. To very and to enhance our understanding of the evaluation of aerial imagery, the, res the results of the application of different prospection methods were combined. Here, the, at the juxtaposition of hexagon imagery with magnetometer data shows three types of settlement forms to be seen also, also in other parts of the hexagon image. As already said before, it is an important issue to validate the archaeological relevance of the features we perceive in aerial imagery. Even the information in magnetometer data is sometimes or often not so easy to read. Therefore, on site inspection and a precise knowledge of the terrain are also in our project absolutely essential for analyzing remote sensing data regarding the identification of of settlement formations through the process of staking out and marking features such as soil marks or plaster edges as we have no crop marks of course in the field. It is possible to understand the relation chips between separated features and to reconstruct some of 
the architectural properties of the site and its urban context based on the knowledge of confirmed sites. Further, archaeological sites can be can be identified in other aerial imagery with greater certainty. So I'm coming to the end. This is a work in progress and also only a part of a larger pro project with the in with the in of historical sources, targeted excavation, the, the evaluation of small pines, and approaches to how to generate a semi automated semi automated classification. Of, mag of magnetometron data, which is a P PhD project of Agnes Schneider. And thank you for your attention.